Um, right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today uh, to um, our webinar three of the series Telegrams from War Struck Ukraine. Um, today we discuss about um, uh, hopeful messages. We discuss about how the Ukraine can resist and can come out uh, victorious um, and can rebuild uh, from this conflict that uh, has struck um, in February 2022 uh, and is uh, ongoing, unfortunately. So we discuss about where hopes come from and um, Actually, hopes come from the people. So we call today, we call today's webinar participatory democracy and the burgeoning civil society in Ukraine. And we have with us today um, a panel of academics specialized in uh, civil society and mass mobilization. Uh, we have Yulia Bidenko. Thank you for joining. She's associate professor in political science at the Karazin Kharkiv National University. Uh, we have uh, Susan Borshek, uh, social scientist at Viadrina University of, of at Frankfurt Oder. Uh, we have uh, Oksana Huns, who is postdoctoral researcher in political science at Bologna University, and we have Alexandra Kaidal, who is a lecturer and she's also specialized in political science and she's affiliated with Kiev School of Economics. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and I would like um, first to describe a little bit to the audience because. Um, not many of us, many of us uh, see the news, but we don't really have a good understanding of um, what is actually, uh, well, how society and the economy actually functions currently in Ukraine. Uh, so we don't know the extent to what, um, to which services, public services are still, um, you know, being, are still serving populations. Um, so we would like to discuss a little bit about that. Could you give us a sense, um, and we can have a free flowing conversation about this. Could you give us a sense um, about, um, you know, railways, postal services, um, public services, how do they function? Do they still, can we talk about a functioning country? I would like to give the word, maybe we start with Yulia. Uh, hello everyone, many thanks for having me here today. Uh, well, actually I would say that uh, not all the services are available for people at the moment, especially uh, in the regions which are affected by the war most. For example, we have an Easter celebration uh, just uh, uh, previous uh, Sunday, and actually in my home city in Kharkiv, uh, some postal services uh, they didn't work in proper manner, and also there are some problems to get to uh, Kharkiv or to Donbas region. Uh, but uh, I would say that evacuation from these. Uh, hot points uh, is uh, uh, pretty available for uh, those uh, citizens who decided to uh, fled the war uh, to, let's say, western or uh, central part of Ukraine. And actually, uh, my point that some services uh, uh, became even more available because uh, in Ukraine, digitalization of the services was kind of a uh, central and uh, uh, mainstreaming point uh, of uh, Zelensky office policy during uh, previous two years. And I would say that uh, if you have these uh, digital uh, digital services um, and used them before, uh, they now expanded and they expanded the list of uh, services which are available for people. Juana, we can hear you at the moment. Thank you. That's really good to hear. Uh, I was saying that um, uh, digitization was accelerated, I think, in many countries over the past two years. And it just uh, a blessing, you know, this pandemic was a blessing in disguise because in, in some ways it accelerated this. Um, but also, obviously, we need a functioning administration. So we need a government that is benevolent, that is looking towards progress. Um, and in order to have such a government, we need uh, citizens who are supporting and are voting such an administration in, in office, right? Um, and so um, I'm just, yeah, I'm kind of uh, wondering about now that you said this, uh, you know, what is the, 
role of citizens demanding services in in the fact that services still function and there's still an infrastructure there and even in the regions which are the most affected um there is still a, a, you know sort of baseline level of um functioning services if if Alexandra. i may uh, yeah, if I may jump in uh, to a bit follow up uh, from Yulia, well, from what Yulia already said. So indeed, we have we, we can speak of communities, hromadas, which are currently occupied, those that have been liberated and are being uh, under construction, and those that are uh, accepting uh, internally displaced people. So we could th say of these three three types. And uh, according to my information, about two hundred. Uh, Romadas uh, are um, either as the zone of uh, direct uh, military c uh, conflict or are occupied. And uh, in uh, Ukraine, there are uh, 1,490 Romadas. So you, you can see how much is uh, how much is the proportion. Uh, speaking of uh, those that are uh, taking uh, the internal displaced people, uh, I would say it's not just the that demand that is important and holding the services on the on the on the go, but also the supply. So one of the um, one of the ideas of uh, Ukrainian resistance is that just by doing your job as a nurse, as an administration, a tax officer, um, you name it, you are contributing to the resistance and uh, to to the resilience. So this uh, motivation comes also from the people at at the at the location and of course of course the demand is also there but this is something that has been um, developing over the past eight years uh, rather than something that is new and here i would um, name a few um, big uh, initiatives or movements uh, for example for the transparency and integrity of local administrations they elected uh, self-government administrations uh, this has been a huge pressure which came not only from the civil society as one may expect but also from within the administrations themselves and that is a movement that has been um, with, with the elected officials, also the appointed officials and civil society joint forces together elaborating the new rules of integrity and uh, transparency. Uh, and I think that is something that um, later at this point also contributed to that there is this supply. So the, the integrity also means working for, for, for victory just by doing what you're doing. Oh, thank you for the intervention. Um, I, I just before I uh, pass the word to Susan, I was just wondering, you're talking about these past eight years uh, since reforms have been sustained and uh, have been forthcoming, not only from citizens um, demanding them, but also from administrations realizing that we need to offer better services. So uh, these eight years are you talking about since the Maidan revolution? Is that what the, the starting point of, of this uh, snowball of reforms uh, is? If I just uh, before Suzanne can continue just a small intervention, I think the, my, the Euro Maidan or the revolution of dignity was the, um, the impulse for uh, scaling up the effort mm -hmm. but the uh, um, initial uh, call for more participation for more integrity for more transparency and uh, anti-corruption this has been um, going over uh, through at least several revolutions that we have seen but there were also even more uh, less noticeable internationally protests and movements that have been also contributing to this Thank you very much. Susan, you wanted to add something, please? Yeah, thank you. I absolutely agree with Julius and, and Alexandra's words. And I think there is one thing that we also see that, that should be maybe noted as a sort of a follow up. So when we are talking about the motivation, why to maintain these, uh, these supply, uh, supply chains, these supply activities of um, public services, I think there is one more aspect that is really new to Ukraine and which only appeared in this in this terrible crisis right now. And this is, I think, the international recognition towards Ukraine's progresses done through the last year. So one very important example, in particular here in Germany, is the digitalization of the educational system. That is something that impresses every single person in Germany who has to do something with the educational system, be it having kids in schools or being uh, concerned about um, educational policies. 
Um, and here, a completely new well, image of Ukraine appeared to many European and other countries so that Ukraine could show that uh, it is an absolutely modern country. It is in some respects much more modern than, for example, Germany uh, in that point. And uh, just to keeping up these services is also to show how modern, how progressive the country is in these uh, in these aspects. And I think that people are very impressed um, by um, Ukraine's high level of digitalization. Um, people are also impressed, for example, um, that uh, universities still are working. Uh, I see this, for example, every two weeks in our session, uh, in a session that is called Voices from Ukraine, where we invite scholars from Ukraine just to present their research, a very usual thing, but of course it is under the conditions of war. And whenever our guests join these, these uh, sessions, they are deeply impressed that people just continue their work as they did before. Um, and this, this image of Ukraine of resisting, of continuing and of not stopping being in a, in a um, progression, uh, progression and being in a process of uh, further development um, is extremely impressive. And I think this changing image of Ukraine is also something that may help to maintain all these services. Oh yes, absolutely. I can echo that. It's uh, so inspirational to see um, how many changes, how many very quick changes, and how well coordinated the changes have been. Um, it's it's so easy to see. I mean, just like you were talking about these research initiatives and invited uh, inviting speakers from Ukraine, I can see that Kiev School of Economics has. Um, I'm sure that in many other uh, subjects, but in economics, which is my area of expertise. Um, they have Frontiers for Economics seminars um, where we, they have international speakers of, of, of high repute. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting because in the past it was rare to see a very, very big speaker from somewhere like Harvard and MIT um, speaking online. Of course, there have been opportunities through the, through the crisis, but now we're converging or convening uh, at Kiev School of Economics online platform. And that's just great because we suddenly we have many more bridges to throughout across Europe rather than just, you know, a few clusters in the West. So I just think that that's absolutely fantastic to see. So I completely agree with that. Um, I wanted to return uh, or I wanted to uh, kind of reflect a little bit more on the point of uh, the efficiency of services uh, and a prerequisite of that, as you've already mentioned, is transparency in administration and, and the goodwill of politicians of government um, to invest in these services, right? So, um, and I know Oksana um, would have a lot to say about the importance of anti-corruption uh, measures in increasing that transparency. So maybe you want to add a little bit, Oksana. Yes, thank you. Uh, maybe to follow up with a few words on the previous discussion, so why everyone was so um, amazed or surprised by these changes that they were so fast or that Ukraine is so advanced. I think this is uh, also a um, Western way of thinking uh, in superpowers oh. that uh, kind of prohibited uh, maybe uh, to see what is going on in Ukraine, because uh, the country like Ukraine, uh, it's not only Ukraine is one of the countries that are heavily underestimated just because they are somewhere in between of superpowers on the border, on the edge. And uh, even if uh, we are looking through this rationalist perspective on security, uh, people are not recognizing states what is inside but looking at the states it's uh, a black box and uh, the examples that uh, we are bringing now from ukraine they show how crucial it is to open these black boxes and to understand the society from uh, within and uh, what is crucial to understand about ukraine and here comes the link to anti-corruption that uh, the country evolved uh, in the very short time a new social contract uh, and anti-corruption is an indicator for that. So as an indicator on the national level, we see that uh, independent anti-corruption institutions have been established. And these institutions, they uh, include prevention of corruption, but also investigation of corruption. Mm -hmm. In 2020, we saw first cases when the uh, high anti-corruption court started um, condemning and um, punishing high-level 
corrupt politicians, which was really revolutionary in terms of the um, all uh, predecessing anti-corruption movement, because we saw uh, the Orange Revolution, it has anti-corruption aspects in it because he was against the electoral fraud and Euromaidan, it was the, against uh, this highly kleptocratic uh, regime of uh, Yanukovych who fled to Russia with his family, in fact. And uh, now finally, we came to the turning point where we saw this indicator that it's working. And this indicator is important because it shows, okay, there is social contract. And in my perception, it means that society evolved. Uh, it, it's not anymore a post-Soviet society. Like the struggle is to leave this post-Sovietness behind and to become something new with the new identity. And this war, this is also a struggle uh, for the new identity. Uh, and it's not necessarily like new identity because Ukraine has thousand years history, but like redefining the social contract and shaping this identity into institutions and into borders and framing that. This is what is this all war about and what this uh, process, long process of development in Ukraine is about. And in the corruption, this is an indicator that finally the society succeeded. Mm. And I have to say that, uh, again, from an outsider perspective, uh, the country branding is very, very quickly consolidating now and uh, with excellent communication on the part of, um, of course, the Zelensky administration, I think. Um, you know, is is, is um, and for good reason highly commended in the way he communicates with leaders of other countries. Um, Yulia, you wanted to, I, I believe, you wanted to have um, an addition to this. Yeah, I wanted to, to uh, share my own experience, uh, uh, continuing what uh, Susan and Oksana said. Actually, uh, I'm teaching at Corazon National University. Uh, two out of six buildings of that was totally destroyed by uh, Russian artillerists and in, in the result of bombing. But still, uh, we are teaching, we relaunch uh, our educational process and uh, our students are spread all over Ukraine. Some of them are staying in Kharkiv with their uh, families and some even flat uh, in Europe, but still today I have uh, two lectures before our meeting and I could say that uh, we have uh, very motivated students even uh, trying to be involved in uh, the programs of Western universities which were kindly uh, promoted and uh, uh, proposed by uh, partner universities, they still very interested in uh, our courses and uh, my second point about that Ukraine was underestimated, uh, definitely. So for me, and I try to promote, you know, this uh, point because uh, um, as to me, and there were so much, uh, let's say, Russian Eurasian, uh, Eurasian studies uh, in Western uh, institutions, and a lot of uh, persons who were kind of uh, uh, scholars there, they often. Uh, uh, started Ukraine using Russian uh, optics, you know, because they knew Russian, but they never uh, uh, could understand Ukrainian. So they primarily used Russian sources, or let's say they used uh, Western sources, which also uh, more or less were connected to Russian. And uh, finishing with sharing my experience uh, on or what uh, Aksana said, uh, uh, actually, uh, just a week ago, the uh, Freedom House uh, report uh, regarding nations and friends that, uh, was released. And uh, uh, actually, uh, thanks to Alexander's recommendations, the CI was the author of uh, the report uh, on Ukraine. And actually, I faced with the situation that uh, in such, you know, international uh, ranking, you can't, uh, you know, estimate your country with a five. Uh, because during the long, long years, it was uh, estimated with a three point. Uh, I'm saying not exactly about this year report, but still. Uh, so when you have uh, these uh, uh, improvements in uh, civil society, in anti-corruption policies, 
you can just uh, you know uh, get the highest ranking because uh, your predecessors uh, uh, they uh, estimated uh, uh, it's too low and actually it's kind of a trap of countries which are on the edge uh, as a planet. Yeah, you know, I completely agree. When we're talking about points, are we talking about the scale from zero to ten or something like that? That that yeah. that were. Um, um, no, I I think it's you've got you had a very hard job, but you know what? I'm going to take that report and have a look at it. Uh, thank you for um, um for pointing it out, Alexandra, please. Yeah, I also would like to like catch, catch up with uh, what was uh, said and uh, basically two points. Uh, one about uh, Ukraine being underestimated. I think we are here in a, a bit of a paradox because on the one hand, Ukrainian civil society is the strongest democratic element in Ukraine for years. So this Freedom House report has been reflecting it. But in practice, this means, uh, and, and the media, by the way, too, and in practice, this means that we have high transparency and very high voice of civil society criticizing the government, mm -hmm. exposing all the problems mm -hmm. with uh, mm -hmm. corruption and other issues. Since, um, and here I can also uh, relate a bit to, to uh, Susan's work, but since Ukrainian civil society is so included in the international networks, for example, Ukrainian journalists are part of OCCRP project, right, that exposes corruption. So there was so much evidence of how terrible things are, oh. which uh, puts Ukraine in a very unfavorable position, but together with uh, developed democracies with uh, a functioning uh, freedom of speech. Because if we look at the countries like, like Russia, they, their problems are not exposed because there is a censorship. And so somehow Ukraine was always standing out with uh, information about what's wrong, mm. although not noticing that the very fact that we know it is actually what's right about uh, our country. Of course. And, I think, and, and maybe the second point I wanted to mention, um, referring to what Oksana has been already um, discussing about the social contract, being redesigned is about ownership. So in 2016, I was interviewing uh, volunteers who were supporting uh, the army of Ukraine back then, and they were already uh, expressing the idea, it's my country, I have to save Ukraine, and I am not even waiting for somebody else to come and do that. And I think this is perhaps part of a social contract that we are here discussing. Um. So it's really interesting because it's kind of it's gener these generations are, are are I'm looking at uh, and I'm obviously the Ukraine is the supreme example of that. I'm also looking at other countries in East, in Eastern Europe, uh, which comes so, sort of woken up recently. Uh, uh, civil society now going from civil society to the actual political class. So a lot more people who used to be just civil society or even in the private sector and are now actively getting engaged in politics precisely because of this reason that we are the people we've been waiting for. Um, and so I think that that's a very big, um, important part of the story of the uh, wonderfully brave resilience uh, of, of the army and of the Ukrainian people in the face of uh, the uh, Russian aggression. Um, I was wondering also, can we talk a little bit about what is centralized and what is, what is decentralized in uh, in the way that uh, Ukraine uh, first resists the aggression. So you could think, I mean, you could guess that the military services and the um, uh, armed forces are more centralized, but then there are also um, maybe lo more local structures that support that defense. Um, and so I, I was just wondering, what is the degree of decentralization? Has the balance between center and regions shifted um, in the administration? I wonder, Yulia, could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, well, actually, uh, decentralization reform in Ukraine uh, was more about uh, local government and uh, how to empower people in their communities. Uh, it wasn't related uh, directly to, to the military issues and defense issues, for sure, because uh, um, I don't know a lot of uh, good examples uh, when you have decentralized uh, uh, army uh, which could face the aggression of uh, one of the strongest 
uh, army of the road. I mean, Russia, like they, they claim they, they be. Uh, well, actually, uh, decentralization for me uh, was a very positive factor for uh, nowadays Ukrainian resilience because uh, actually we can see the uh, loyalty of uh, local uh, politicians and local elites uh, and actually being uh, from Kharkiv, I do remember how they tried to organize Russian Spring in my city and uh, in 2014 and then uh, we questioned the loyalty of local elites, and uh, I think it was one of the crucial factors which uh, led Donbass to, to, to the, uh, let's say, Russian occupation, and uh, we didn't allow to make the, the same with Kharkiv, for example. But actually now we see that loyalty of local elites, uh, local uh, authorities is much, much higher, because they have a lot of resources, and they... Uh, aware about the situation in Russia that it, it is even being, you know, annexed uh, but not occupied with uh, such uh, uh, cruel atrocities Russia can launch on any territory that they, uh, they have been in Ukraine. But actually, uh, people uh, do understand, I mean, local uh, deputies uh, and mayors, they clearly understand that they will never get uh, such level of resources that uh, they uh, uh, collected uh, due to decentralization uh, and managed due to decentralization in Ukraine. It's my first point. And the second point, that actually uh, decentralization was one of the most well-known and promoted reforms within Ukraine during uh, previous six years. And the average people and activists of civil society uh, they uh, increase the level of trust to their local uh, mm -hmm. authorities. And the second, the level of local participation, the participation on, on local level, also increase all over Ukraine despite the region. So it's not uh, anymore about Eastern political culture, Western type of political culture, which was kind of a popular concept to, to analyze Ukraine before. I understand. And also, um, so are you saying that uh, the process of decentralization has been going on for a while now? Uh, there have been reforms, presumably during the past eight years, or have these reforms started much earlier? Well, these reforms uh, were discussed uh, since uh, uh, 2005, uh, after the Yushinka came, but it was not so successful, and mostly uh, only the large cities, like uh, regional capitals, they have this uh, economical freedom and uh, more freedom that uh, 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 average communities had uh, in Ukraine. Uh, mm -hmm. The reform started in 2015, and actually since then, it is very important. We have two circles of uh, uh, local elections in 2015 and in 2020, which actually came to power a lot of civil activists uh, uh, working in the field. It was one of the most important uh, things uh, regarding Ukraine, especially that these elections were free and uh, very uh, considerable, and a lot of local actors were the winners, not the Zelensky party even. I see. Yeah, okay. Um, Susan? Yeah, I think so. Thank you, Julia. I totally agree. And I think one important aspect of this decentralization process and of all these reforms is exactly that it helped to close this gap between civil society and politics. Because when you were saying that, um, well, after Euromaidan, people started to recognize, and, and even now people recognize that that they themselves are those they were waiting for in politics. Um, this also was supported by the decentralization process when it was much easier for citizens and also for civil society to enter the political um, decision processes without already maybe entering the political system. Because I think what what was an what is what made an extremely an extreme difference um, in the Ukrainian perspective on politics and on the political system was that after Euromaidan, um, people also had the impression that this gap between civil society and the political system has to be closed. That 
okay, the political or politicians are somehow, well, we don't trust them, but now we have to enter the administrations and the parliament, although just we, we don't want to, we would like to stay in, in the nice uh, cloud of the civil society, but somehow we have to go there. And I think that um, there's a high barrier to do that when, when you start, well, thinking bad maybe about politicians or the political system just to change your mind. But decentralization processes made it much easier for people to enter political processes and to recognize exact, exactly that they can change things, that they can be responsible for what is going on uh, in their own yard or in their own villages. And um, um, there were, for example, um, uh, processes such as um, participatory, budget, participatory budgeting um, and other forms of um, participative democracy and um, participation on a very low level. And this made it much easier for people to enter these processes, to come into debates, to see what they can do and they, what they can't do. Um, what are their, what is the scope of their activities? And I think this is also what we can see today that um, I would I would argue that Ukrainian civil or the Ukraine, Ukrainian Ukrainian society still is a little bit characterized by this. On the one hand, a sort of keeping a distance to the political system or keeping a distance and sort of mistrust towards politics. So no one is like hurrah, our political system is, is great, and I totally identify with that. But on the other hand, people people of course want to be responsible for what they see and what they can do. And I would call that sort of friendly anarchism maybe, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that makes it much more easier now for people to get into a political process and to to engage wherever they see a small aspect that that um, that gives them a possibility to do something and to change change something. And I think that decentralization was extremely important for that. Um, yeah, and thank you for these points, Julia, Susan, and I think I would dare to guess also that um, the further digitization of services further helps people get closer to the administrative process and then get involved in uh, local administration. Um, and then there's only a step from that to um, even political participation. So actually enrolling in a political party and then um, representing people at um, at central level as well. Um, are you? There was a hand from Alexandra. I don't know if that was a historical hand or if you wanted to add a point. Um, otherwise, I, uh, I, I let Oksana and then I will go after her. There was a historical hand, but I do have something to say later. Oh, for sure. OK, so preemptive hands there from Alexandra. So let's let's go to Oksana and hear what she uh, has to say. Yeah, I just want to follow up on uh, what Julia and Susanna said that uh, really, really important maybe to uh, understand this continuity of development of civil society in Ukraine. This is a bit difficult for uh, Western European uh, countries, what I see from uh, other discussions, uh, that uh, the civil society on the national level, it developed uh, in a um, kind of uh, professionalized manner. So. It wasn't like grassroots civil society, but uh, these were uh, organizations that were fulfilling their role, something between think tank and between uh, advocacy organization, uh, something in between. And these were people speaking English, having and developing professional expertise and that were able, they were able to provide the advice on the national level uh, when the window of opportunity opened for reforms. But uh, this kind of civil society has been developing, uh, well, again, 2004 revolution gave the input for that, but it was a continuity process. What the decentralization reform gave, uh, and it's just to frame and to put it into context what uh, Julia and Susan said, that this uh, participatory participation in uh, decision making in, became possible. Also, uh, thanks to the digitalization reform, because uh, all the decision making processes and engagement of citizens became manageable, which wasn't possible before. Uh, and this decentralization gave uh, the opportunity, the space that people were able to engage. Uh, and now I would like to put into context uh, what Julia said about uh, that the decentralization gave um, this um, trustworthiness kind of for local elites that they became faithful to Ukraine. 
And here I would like to make the reference to our Telegram 2 uh, series about strategic corruption, where we were talking that Russia is uh, using uh, strategic corruption in the West to make countries dependent and to uh, bring uh, them independency uh, to blackmail maybe uh, so that they are not able uh, to impose sanctions or something else. Uh, even more, these processes were visible in Ukraine. So the elites, they were very much uh, in the connection uh, to Russia and very much under uh, this um, corrupt, uh, engaged in the corrupt networks. And uh, almost every major scandal around uh, high level political corruption in Ukraine was also including connections to Russia. Is it a recent scandal 2019 in defense sector or a constitutional crisis uh, 2020? So there was always, and even scandals before uh, Yanukovych, as I said, he fled to Russia. Mm -hmm. So this way was always there. And uh, to realize that the local elites, although they were under this systematic pressure and kind of having those corrupt incentives because Russia was uh, subtly working on the local level, very much investing in um, uh, the, 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 the versante. Um, I don't know what's the word to translate. It's small terrorist groups. <laughs> yes, small terrorist groups or uh, people who will be in place if Russian army comes, so they are able to take the role of uh, local authorities. Mm -hmm. And uh, seeing this um, loyalty to Ukraine of local authorities, this, in, this is not uh, self-evident or not natural at all. This is something really... Uh, special that we have to appreciate in this context. Very interesting um, and, and of course a powerful statement here and it showcases the, how fast and how bold the transition, societal transition has been in recent years. Um, Alexandra, did you want to add something before we move on? Because I wanted us to also discuss, uh, in, also in connection to this, the role of identities in, in this transformation. Right, it's just a short, uh, uh, short maybe linking, because we Oksana has talked about the professional civil society had, that has emerged, and that there are uh, grassroots organizations. But what was also happening over the past, uh, I would say, seven years is that these professionals they were creating regional coalitions, linking their expertise to local activism. And thus creating this vertical or let's say networks that were going down uh, to the uh, to the ground. And uh, in that case, in that case, for me, it's like a sign that the society started to be less at uh, atomized. And um, in the uh, and at the local level, what perhaps to add? Why is there these elites? They were also changing their all, why they were staying loyal. Is that um, we were seeing a lot of cross sectoral collaboration on uh, important issues of development. So it's not just politicians doing something, but they were always engaging uh, local business for that. So mm -hmm. they are very important stakeholders and civil society. And that create and thus we have, uh, if you could, I imagine Ukraine as a, some sort of a network carpet with wires going between sectors and going from the national to local level through the societal um, links. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting tapestry to um, to to illustrate. Um, um, okay, um, and so if we have this beautiful network where everyone is more or less now working in cohesion with the others, um, can we still talk about identity politics? Um, and so what's, what's the role of identity in this transformation? What's the role of identity in this uh, resilience and, and resistance to the Russian aggression? And um, I don't know who, who, who could we, who would we, who would like to start talking about this topic? We don't have to develop it um, very much, but if you wanted to add at least your from your opinions and your experiences, Yulia, would you like to try and tell us your opinion on this? Uh, yes, uh, I would like to. And actually, uh, if you let me to share just uh, uh, like a figure, uh, 
well actually which is uh, very uh, actually, which is very correspondent with uh, with uh, all that that was said uh, by my colleagues before actually uh, the uh, main route of ukrainian resistance at the moment for me is a primarily civic not ethnic not legal identity which is shared uh, by uh, ukrainians uh, and actually the civil society which was developed before decentralization and what is very important decentralization happened under the digitalization process or in digital era uh, also was very important, but uh, the war in Donbass uh, uh, created the civic identity, not the regional one, not the, I would say, uh, the, the ethnic one. But uh, actually, if we uh, just take uh, have a look uh, on uh, the um, self-identity uh, answers uh, of Ukrainians, um, uh, it, uh, was uh, conducted uh, just like two weeks ago by rating group, we can see that more than 90% of Ukrainians, uh, they feel themselves more of a citizen of Ukraine. And uh, actually, it was very important. And the new trend that uh, actually uh, one quarter of Ukrainians also consider themselves to be European people, representative of European civilization. And uh, just last one picture, if you can see it, uh, that actually it's not related to language uh, which people do use uh, their families at home. Uh, you can see that only half of uh, Ukrainians speak in Ukrainian on daily basis. But now uh, it is crucial to change and we can see that the war affected this, uh, you know, consensus uh, regarding that Ukrainian uh, should be the only state language and Russian uh, shouldn't be taken like a second uh, uh, language in the state, regional language. So we can see that people from different lang uh, lingual, I would say, uh, origin or people with a different ethnic origin or even Russian origin, because we have a lot of people with uh, uh, Vietnamese uh, African roots uh, among Ukrainian current uh, politicians, among our students. So uh, it is really diversity of, uh, I would say, ethnical belonging, but primarily people have uh, their uh, civic uh, identity. And there is a crucial driver for now they resistance for me. Uh, splendid that uh, you've also illustrated this with uh, these very fresh graphs um, just recently generated two weeks ago. Um, and yeah, the, 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 trend, the, the shift is very, very clear in these graphs. Um, and I, I didn't know, I don't know what the other panel members feel about this. Um, do, you, do you agree with this characterization that uh, there is a very strong civic identity? I'm seeing some nods around the room. Alexandra, did you want to add something? Very short. This is, I think, what I try to ex express as an ownership, so that no matter what is the ethnic identity, we uh, we have people saying that Ukraine is their home. And um, actually, one more is the civic identity part. It's already from the research of uh, uh, Olga Ono, who couldn't be here, is that she showed that uh, the uh, likelihood or readiness of people to protest if they see injustice or their freedom is being um, under attack was like growing almost uh, in parallel to the graph that Yulia just said. So um, in fact, Russia attacked Ukraine uh, at the peak of its rising civic identity. So we, can we say uh, that uh, the conflict has actually increased social cohesion? Um, I know we can see correlations, but do you have a sense that there is a causal relationship between the attacks and the social cohesion then? Susan, did you want to come up on that one? Yeah, I think definitely there's a correlation and I would say, well, on a very basic or in a, from a very basic perspective, we can say that um, the, being Ukrainian is uh, or has been much more forced now by Putin's war than it has than than it was was it is stronger than it was ever before. Mm -hmm. But the interesting aspect that I would like to 
uh, draw some attention on is that um, well, when we are talking about identity, we can frame it from two perspectives. So identity can be a rather exclusive identity so that you build your identity based on the on um, on the discussion what you are not or what you exclude from being part of the identity or it can be an inclusive identity mm -hmm. um, and i think the interesting aspect here is although ukraine is under threat now and although ukrainian identity is increasing um, or is strengthened by this attack it is still not an exclusive way of building up the identity it is still an inclusive one and this is in general, not the not the not the most often way to build a collective identity. Um, so it is remarkable, and it is in, in particular remarkable as it is an inclusive identity that is built up under threat. So people still continue to argue that we are part of the civilized world. We are we are part of of a civilized Europe. We are of course not Russia. So there's the exclusion. But this is mm -hmm. still not about only. I don't know, people with a, uh, with a very open tattoos are <laughs> Ukrainian or something like that. So, so this is not about being absolutely patriotic um, or something like that. It is still this, um, this aspect of sharing a certain, um, well, aspect of civilization, sharing a certain belief, sharing a certain social solidarity and abstract solidarity also. And this is still this inclusive way of building up an identity. Of course, there's always the danger that this changes, that identity might become more exclusive one day, that it might become more closed, more nationalistic, more patriotic, more whatever. Um, I see this danger, maybe not at the moment, but um, in an ongoing war, um, of course, it is. Um, it, it would be very likely. But I definitely hope that um, trust and um, also this um, this shared social solidarity among Ukrainians will stay strong enough so that identity building is still more inclusive and is still more about what we are and not what we are not. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a very, very interesting point and a nice nuance to make there, a nice distinction. Thank you for bringing that uh, to the fore, Susan. Um, and since we're now talking about a sustainable um, a societal shift. Uh, I, I was wondering if we think more long term about, uh, as it seems that the con, uh, you know, this is a longer term conflict. It's turning out into a um, a protracted war. And so the question is, uh, what will sustain that societal resilience? Um, to, of course, resist the aggression, to come out victorious, and also, of course, to rebuild afterwards. So. Um, what what sort of mechanisms are we talking about? What organizational structures would you um, would you cite here? Oksana, please. Yeah, um, maybe we just technical point, Julia. Can you stop sharing the screen, please? <laughs> Uh, does it work? Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Thanks. Yes, so one of the points we didn't raise, I feel, in uh, this super interesting discussion, uh, that the civil society networks, they um, were able to express uh, pressure um, at some points, critical points, when the government wasn't open to uh, input from the society, when the government was closed. Um, this uh, collaboration with international partners was super important. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so to say, principle of sandwich when civil society together with international organizations or international partners uh, provides pressure uh, to move government despite all the odds to uh, do some reforms that they don't want to do for different reasons. This might be a corruption reason, but this might be just a convenience reason that we don't want to uh, change uh, the way how we work. So um, this role of international partners remains also very important now uh, to sustain this resilience as well. Uh, so one thing is, of course, uh, the support with weapon uh, to Ukraine, but uh, other point is uh, all the humanitarian assistance and uh, remaining uh, strong with regards to the uh, integration of Ukraine into the EU. Uh, 
uh, in terms of values, but in terms also of uh, economy. So uh, this collaboration or cohesion, <laughs> this natural integration of Ukrainian society into the European society or democratic society, uh, that had be it must be sustained and it must be uh, pro um, like proactively supported. Oh, completely. Um, thank you, Oksana. I was wondering if, uh, Yulia, you could give us, especially because you are coming from a region which has been very, very affected, um, can you give us a sense of, do you feel the effect of these, or do people in your region feel the effect of the international collaborations here? Well, actually, uh, Kharkiv is not only the region which is currently affected uh, by the war, but uh, it was a huge uh, center of uh, international education. And actually, it was uh, the, the city with the highest number of foreign students, uh, which are left at the moment, of course, but uh, still it was kind of the second largest city of Ukraine with a very developed uh, IT services and uh, actually... 20% of Ukrainian IT sector was located in Kharkiv. And actually, uh, more than 20,000 of uh, foreign students came to Kharkiv uh, every year. And uh, of course, the decisions which were made by uh, largest universities in Kharkiv to stay in Kharkiv, not to relocate, not to you know, evacuate on paper, uh, they were very important as the sign of that this city will be uh, kind of uh, renovated and uh, will uh, show the, the better results uh, even after the war. But I totally, uh, totally agree with Oksana uh, that uh, uh, we can talk about any, uh, you know, stabilization or uh, about any, uh, you know, development before the victory. Because um, we can see from uh, Bucha, from Mariupol, even from Izum, which is located in my region, that actually, uh, and from the messages of Russian propaganda, that uh, they are not, uh, uh, they don't want uh, Ukraine exist as, as the nation, as the developed uh, nation, and of course, uh, every Ukrainian city is still under the threat of Russia. So my first message uh, for international part uh, partners and for voters from uh, democracies, uh, just uh, help uh, to Ukraine with the uh, with, uh, weapon at first hand. The other, the second, my message, which, which I also promote using uh, these uh, kind of platforms, uh, uh, try to appeal to universities, to think tanks that uh, okay, here in Ukraine, we just uh, were busy with survival. We would be the, you know, with how to how to be resilient, uh, not in a long perspective, but uh, how to survive and how to win. And uh, it's actually, I think, uh, uh, could be challenging to develop long-term strategies uh, for Ukraine at the moment for those people who are already in Ukraine. That is why. Uh, intellectual support uh, for Ukrainians and uh, maybe for Ukrainian institutions uh, is very important. And my third point that uh, actually uh, being the proponent of euro integration of Ukraine, I can say that uh, uh, this is uh, not only this, uh, the potential for business activities and for, let's say, uh, better legislation for Ukraine, but uh, actually it is also potential for uh, for, you know, better identity. It's very, uh, it's a source of uh, inspiration in Ukraine to rebuild it uh, because you will be the part of this large European family and you won't be abandoned by uh, those who consider to be your partners and the like. Oh, uh, thank you, Yulia. And I, uh, if you ask me to guess, I would say that the European Union is also thinking along the same lines and thinking that, uh, you know, they would benefit from the rich cultural richness of Ukraine as part of the tapestry of what is the European Union. Uh, but also we are seeing effectively now 
um, how affected all countries in Europe are by, um, you know, the um, the hit, the shock that was uh, the agricultural production of Ukraine is now <laughs> very, very clearly impacting economically all the other countries through the inflation and the um, uh, low supply of basic agricultural produce. I mean, Ukraine was the supplier for so many, many different, uh, you know, from oil to flour and bread products. And so um, that's just one example of how integrated we already are and how that integration needs to be further recognized, I think. Um, before we conclude, I was just, uh, I, I wanted us to uh, round up by uh, maybe summarizing again some of the points um, on the relations between state, local authorities and society and citizens um, in enabling this resilience. So, of course, we already talked some points about the importance of international collaboration, but let's come back to Ukraine, which is at, ultimately in the hand of Ukrainians and they've, they've shown their bravery and they've shown their re um, resolve uh, to see the country through this crisis. Um, and so what's what's next in terms of what is important for Ukrainians to do now and how to collaborate with state and local institutions? Um, I could give the word to Alexandra. We haven't heard from you in a little while. I think for the most important is uh, keep this, what we call uh, with Oksana, uh, collaborative democracy, which is not a, a democracy of agreeableness between civil society and uh, authorities. Rather, it is quite a contest, uh, quite a contestation is in this relation, but it is the being um, on both sides, being open uh, to reason. Uh, we, uh, when we did our research, we saw uh, signs of deliberation in the discussions over anti-corruption, for example. So that is something that needs definitely to be uh, kept. And um, citizen participation has to be in the mind of everyone who thinks about humanitarian aid and about reconstruction. How do we involve people? as stakeholders into these uh, processes. Okay, thank you very much. And if I may ask a very sort of pointed question to, for, for some examples, just for that, for us to get some concrete illustrations of what ha is going on at the moment, how that collaboration is happening. I remember in the first webinar, our speaker told us about the fact that the state is now urging citizens to start working again because everyone was volunteering their time to the uh, you know the, the cause the resistance um, and so I'm just wondering if you can give me some one or two examples of how people have volunteered their time through these difficult uh, past months um, and you know what what should people continue to do in at least in their spare time I'm I'm happy to take any volunteers. <laughs> One example uh, is uh, an NGO that is expert in corruption risk assessments in the legislation. They are now doing uh, a delivery of drones and uh, other uh, materials for for defense. And I think this is the example where they would probably should stop it and come back to to the, what they do best because mm -hmm. there is now a big question, okay, now we have a state of war, but how do our governance uh, and uh, the um, responsibilities and competences are going to be distributed for the, uh, for the reconstruction, for example, mm -hmm. or for aid distribution? So mm -hmm. they, they should be back to what they're doing. That's a pertinent point. Thank you, Susan. Well, I think, of course, it is absolutely clear that heavy weapons will help Ukraine to win the war, but that's not the crucial point. I think Ukraine will win this war and will survive because of its spirit. And this spirit is something that has to do also with the uh, with the 2013-14 years, uh, because I think what I mean in the West, we always talk about the Euromaidan, but I usually use the term of the revolution of dignity, and I think mm -hmm. that dignity is exactly what characterizes Ukrainian uh, society as well. And so I I think that in upholding this spirit 
uh, of being able to win this war and to survive and to have a very prosperous future uh, in the European Union and so on, it is extremely important that people keep on working for this dignity. So, for example, if musicians uh, can give concerts wherever there are smaller cities which have been affected by the war but now are re-liberated, etc. So, uh, when Serhii Jedan is giving a concert in uh, somewhere in, in Kharkiv and so on, and he's helping people, uh, he's volunteering, etc. That is showing that that shows that although there's this terrible war, you still go on concerts. Of course, there's still culture. People are reading books. Um, Organizations like uh, uh, like um, Meridian Chernovitz are still selling books if they can, and they still think about how to prepare book fairs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. This is what makes Ukraine strong, and I think keep keep this dignity because it once helped you in, back in 2013-14, and it will help the country to to hold up the spirit uh, as well this time. Well said. Thank you very much, Susan, and. Uh, fantastic message to end on. Um, I hope that um, audiences, when they hear this, they will be as uplifted as um, I certainly feel right now, because um, you kind of go through uh, the news and day by day goes, and then you keep hearing that the conflict is um, prolonged and morale is affected. So I think we all need to remind ourselves that there are so many uh, fantastic resources that, that Ukrainian people have, and they are such resourceful people. And so when I'm feeling low, I will go back to this talk and uh, and really take my take my hope from it. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Yulia, Oksana, Susan and Alexandra for a fantastic discussion. Um, many, um, of course, many points grounded in your research um, and um, and in very, very um, recent evidence. Yulia, thank you for showing us those graphs. Um, and I will be delighted to have you um, participate in more discussions in the future should you uh, be available. Um, yeah, on behalf of UEA, thank you very much. And uh, we'll let everyone know when uh, the recording will be made available. Have a lovely day, everyone. Thanks a lot, Juan. Thank you. Thank you.